Hello colleagues. The challenge of making these tutorial videos is I have to cater to all viewers. Some viewers are experienced software developer uh, with many years of experience who are here only to learn about Rust. Some viewers are brand new to software development and possibly are considering uh, Rust as their first programming language, which in and of itself is not a bad idea. Um, some people prefer JavaScript as their first programming language, uh, but I think that the JavaScript programming language is, has a very low entry barrier, a uh, very low uh, um, entry. Uh, however, um, I don't think it's necessarily a good language to learn as your first language. Uh, something like Rust or Go uh, possibly is a better option. There's, there's going to be more work, obviously. Um, anyhow, so I try to make uh, these videos um, somewhat short and palatable to try to capture your attention span to a reasonable degree. And so in this video, we are going to take a closer look at the essentially the Hello World app that we built the last time. Um, so if you recall, we uh, started building this trivia app by invoking the cargo new command and then giving it the, uh, the name of the project, in this case, Hello Rustations, and then it gives us this directory. Please ignore this warning here. The reason I'm getting this warning is because um, I store my Rust um, code on an external hard drive outside of my Mac, so that's why you're getting the warning. Anyhow, um, so using the CLI for us to create a new app is, I think, uh, more reasonable than start it from the command line. You can certainly start from the command line and you can uh, run it. Instead of using Cargo Run, you can just use the Rust C compiler to run your, to run your program. You don't, you don't even need an IDE. In fact, if you wanted to, you can uh, set up your Tomo file using Vim, okay, if you wanted to. Or you can Vim, you can Vim uh, source main. You can code like that as well. Some people prefer that. Uh, sometimes I'm one of those people. But I think that generally using an IDE, an integrated development environment like VS Code is the better uh, solution and uh, more consistent if you're in a team, if you're in a corporate environment or you're in a team. So let's go ahead and go to my VS Code, okay? So the command line interface will generate this project for us, right? And it will generate the cargo.tomo file. And we could consider the tomo file as a high-level configuration file where we can uh, inject metadata to the app, right? Now, in an enterprise-level application, there will be many configuration file, but consider this to be at the highest uh, level configuration, okay? And so just like uh, with the package.json, just like with your palm file in Java, you start with the name of the app and then the version and then the author or developers, and then the edition. Now, in my next video, we are going to go into the history of Rust, which I think is important because there were breaking changes prior to, uh, if you're going from the previous, version, the previous version to the 2018 version, there will be breaking changes. But 2018 is the latest version, and uh, again, the next video, we'll go into the history. And then the, on, on line seven, it gives you a reference to uh, documentation at the Rust site. And then under dependency, uh, we imported Ferris. Now, Ferris is the mascot for, um, for, uh, for Rust. It's this little crust rustation or crustacean here, little crap here. Uh, if you want, you can buy a t-shirt with this Rust logo on there. Just, just Google it. Um, so um, we only imported this package to uh, print out stuff to the command line, to, to, the, to the console. Uh, obviously, we don't need to do that to, uh, to print line to the command, to the terminal. Uh, Rust has the print line. 
uh, method to do that, but I wanted you to get the feeling of what developing an app is like. Um, it's not unlike other languages, okay? It's essentially the same process in other languages as well. So on, line, on, on the first line, we're going to import a method from an external package, okay? Again, the double colons are essentially like the dot. In this particular case, we're using this double colon, so like the um, curly braces in TypeScript or in JavaScript, okay? We're importing this package, external package, and then we're importing, we want to use this particular module, the same uh, module, which is the, the method to print out to the terminal, okay? Now, if, if we were to import other packages from other uh, uh, crates, uh, um, it would go here also. Again, so the crates are so like npm packages uh, uh, for um, for us, and you can find out about crates here. Now, why do we want to use crates to begin with? Well, basically, so we don't have to write so much code. Okay, we are leveraging functionality that somebody else has already written and for the most part already have been vetted for us right so that's why there is this concept in software engineering sort of like when you're when you're say when you're a server engineer uh, if you want to move earth you don't build we you don't build a bulldozer by yourself right you can just rent go rent one or go buy a bulldozer to move the earth or you can uh, there are prefabricated bridges as well. So it's the same concept in software engineering. So let's go back to line five. So line five, we are uh, importing the standard, from the standard Rust library, we are importing essentially input and output to the console. In this particular case, is standard out. When I was uh, when I was new to software engineering and I was learning C plus plus, I thought <laughs> I thought standard means STD, sexually transmitted disease, but uh, probably uh, raging raging teenage hormones. But uh, uh, no, it's not, it's not a sexually transmitted disease. It's standard out, the standard in, and then we are importing the buffer writer. So pretty much all server side languages have a buffer mechanism to to read. And then uh, something to write to write to the buffer. Okay, in this case, it's all in one. It's both a reader and a write. And if you want to read more about uh, this particular uh, functionality of this package, you can read it here. Okay, again, just just uh, hover over the the syntax, and it'll give you the uh, definition. So we're going to be using this. That's why we're importing it. So why is this file called main? Why is it called main? Well, in a multi uh, threaded language, there's such a thing as the main thread, right? The main thread and then the child thread, the other threads of execution. It's called main because this is the main thread of execution, and then you have the main entry point in the main thread of execution. That's why the function here is called the main, right? The main method or the main function. So in, say, Java or C Sharp, you have the main, uh, main method inside of your parent class. Okay, so in uh, in JavaScript and TypeScript, um, uh, of course, TypeScript is just syntactic sugar for JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript you know, is a single thread language, so you, it's called index. Right? Index.js is the entry point. Here, uh, the function, the main function is the main thread of execution, the main thread. So uh, we are declaring a variable here. Okay, uh, variable for all intents and purposes in Rust is immutable, cannot be changed, okay? There is an exception to that. I'll get into that later. By the way, this part here, that's just something that's provided to me by the plugin or the extension to VS Code. It's just metadata for this particular variable. Now, um, I'm assigning this variable to the standard console out, locking out console, locking out statement to the console. And then we in, we end this expression with a semicolon. Uh, so in, in Rust, you need a semicolon after every expression. However, in, statement, in statements, you do not. The difference between um, expression and statements 
in Rust at a very high level is that an expression is value producing or effect causing evaluation. Okay? And statements contain an explicitly sequenced expression evaluation. Now I can spend hours going into the intricacy of these two uh, differences, uh, but for the time for the time being, we we'll just uh, look at it from a high level, and you you understand you will understand the differences when you get more repetition. Um, those of you who are experienced software engineer watching this, you you know that already. But for pe people who are brand new to programming, uh, don't worry. The, with the more reps, you're gonna get better understanding of uh, of how the language works. And when I say rep, I mean repetition. So, moving on to line sixteen. Uh, again, we have an immutable, uh, an immutable uh, variable, and uh, in Rust we declare a variable with the let keyword. Um, again, this is metadata from my IDE telling you, telling me that uh, the, the type of uh, the type for um, the message variable is a string, and here we explicitly declaring a string, and from string we have a trait call from. So trait is sort of like an interface into what a particular uh, method is going to be. Okay. Again, we will get into this a little bit later. If you want to read up on traits, uh, particularly from read the documentation, I can regurgitate that to you. But I'll just go one ear out the other. You will retain more if you read it on your own. So from this string, okay. So from this string. I'm going to assign it to the variable called message, okay? And then on line 18, I am dynamically capturing the, length, the width of this particular string, okay? I think there's 24 characters in this string, including spaces. Now, I can certainly explicitly um, put 24, reserve 24, but, that's, but then I would, reserve, I would maintain state. Okay, so I want to dynamically compute the width. Okay, I said earlier that all variables with all variable with the let keyword is immutable, unless you don't want it to be. So in the cases where you do not want a variable to be immutable in Rust, you can uh, prefix the uh, variable name with the keyword mut. Of mute, okay. Now, obviously, mute has to go after let, okay. Again, this is, again, this is the metadata from VS Code, and then I'm assigning it to the buffer writer, uh, and then the buffer writer essentially is going to write this, write this out to the console, okay, and then um, we are using the say method from the package. That we uh, imported in from Ferris says, okay. So from this package, we are only using one method, okay. Now in the real world, does that happen? Sometimes it was a small package, and um, we want to use some sort of security function, or, or or something that's essential, critical for operation on the server side. We will just use the one method. So in this particular case, we're um, using. Uh, this method essentially to read and print out uh, some uh, some some lines uh, and uh, and text to the um, terminal. And if you hover on the same method from the first package, it will give you the function signature and what is what signature is required. Or what uh, variable in this data type you can see there okay and what the return method is okay so again let's let's refresh your memory here we're just using the same method to print out these lines up here print out the vertical lines print out the text that we declare in the message variable and then we're going to print out this line here this line here and then these little lines, these little characters that um, uh, will form the shape of Ferris here. Okay. 
And the width is determined by the dynamic width that I mentioned earlier. Here. Okay. Again, we can certainly have used uh, uh, print line to print this out. But then what would be the fun in that, right? So uh, I think that's it for now. In the next video, we are going to go into the history of Rust because I think that's somewhat important. And then after that, uh, we're going to go into debugging, uh, which, is, which is what this file is all about. Okay, good luck. Muchas gracias, mis amigos. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.